pulling from the road. I have bad coverage, so I might at times have to switch off my video, but I hope you're able to follow the meeting. Brilliant. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. Much appreciated. Um, uh, and it's good to see um, MLAs here, and it's, uh, you know, I know it's such a busy time for everybody, so it's good to see everyone coming along. Um, we just, as I say, I know uh, Naomi is coming, is joining soon. She had something else before us, so we will be sort of starting soon. Um, and uh, what we were going to cover is, uh, Naomi will obviously do introductions and welcome. I'll talk a little bit about um, the current state of endometriosis uh, care, although some of you will know about that as well as me. And then we've got some questions that we've already received, which we'll go through. And then as I say, if people have other questions, if they'd like to put them in the chat. And I'm sort of hoping, I know some people will be on phones and it's not as easy. So if there's anything you can't, can't send over, do, do um, you know, we will try and answer those afterwards as well um, with that. Um, so this is a bit where normally we'd be like milling about and, um, uh, and, and chatting and things, having a, 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 a orange juice or something at the beginning of the, the meeting. Um, yeah, um, in terms of Hannah, we, we don't ever recommend individual um, named um, practices, uh, people rather. So Hannah's asked if there's any clinics um, that would be recommended for treatment. What we do recommend, um, and as others will know, is that um, you, in, if you are looking for treatment elsewhere, is to go to somewhere, if it's in the UK, in England, that's um, accredited by the BSGE, the British Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, um, because uh, that, that is the way that it goes for, that things happen. As I say, we're just waiting for Naomi, who I know did have another meeting before us, so I'm sure she'll be joining us shortly. Um, and um, uh, it's really great, as I say, to see Paula, um, who hosted an event for us last year. Someone was asking Paula if we'd done this before, and I was explaining that we did an event uh, last year that you kindly hosted. It seems like a foreign land now, those sort of events in, in, in Parliament buildings, when people would have came along and you'd tell their stories. And I think the Health Minister joined us as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that was our last thing that we managed to get in before COVID, actually. It was very touch and go, I think, on that one. We did. I wonder. I wonder while when while we're waiting for Naomi, I had heard from a constituent around the lead consultant in endometriosis um, has left. Is there any more information you have on that, or is anybody aware of the current status? I don't have any up-to-date information on, on what's happened since. My understanding is that he, he's left, and again, there might be people locally who who know differently. Um, and because of the way the BSG centres work is you have to, to be a, an accredited centre, you have to have people with certain levels of skills. And I think we're already hearing, um, and Claire and um, Alicia were talking earlier before we started, um, around the fact that there's what can only be described as completely horrendous waiting lists at the moment coming through. So I know that um, even before COVID, I mean, we're going to, uh, you know, even before COVID, um, there were some real issues with waiting times in, in Northern Ireland. Um, what I, one of the things that I feel is an issue with how endometriosis care is done across the UK is that it's quite often been left up to um, individuals with an interest to set up specialist centres. So rather than there being planning from the top that says we need this, it's waited until someone's gone, oh, I'm really interested in this, I'll do something locally. Um, and so I think that there is a, an issue, uh, maybe um, uh, Naomi and the MLAs could, could consider taking this away about how, if, if there's no specialist care for treatment in Northern Ireland, how are people being, being done? Uh, hello, Andrew, nice to see you there. Thank you. Um, so I'm afraid you've got me sort of wittering a bit as we wait for Naomi, who's our star guest. So I'm sorry to say I'm Emma, um, I'm, I should change my title. I'm uh, Emma Cox. I'm the CEO at Endometriosis UK. Um, I'll just put my name in there so that it's easy to see. Spelt it right? Yep. There we go. Um, um, a, a, another issue that came up with Self and Colm um, had a, a meeting with people with, in relation to fairness and infertility. So obviously there's a crossover between what you know um, users are dealing with tonight and then obviously then the suspension of the majority of the services in the regional fertility centre. So that is on our radar. And so it's quite timely that this event's happened tonight. Obviously, you know, Colm is the chair of the health committee. And, and I raised the issue of the lack of services for endo 
patients with the health minister, but I suppose it's something probably coming off the back of this meeting tonight, we could formally follow up. So yeah. it, it is timely, especially with the, the waiting list growing because of COVID. Yeah. And I think one of one of our concerns um, is if we look at the sort of UK picture, is we already know that there was a um, from survey work we did in March, just last March, just before COVID, um, that 30% of patients in the UK were waiting 10 or more months, <clears throat> but that's very skewed. So in Northern Ireland, it was 40% of the people who responded have been waiting more than 10 months. Uh, and we know from FY speaking, is this, it's an automatic Department of Health. Um, that uh, the NHS in, in Northern Ireland that again automatically what the person long waiting lists as oh, well. Right. Wow. Never seen that. No. So. What's this particular? Elaine, I've muted you. You were talking. I know Elaine. I'm not being that rude. Don't worry. I do know. I just I just realised I'm so sorry, and then I muted myself. It's okay. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> um, great. And um, I see that Naomi is showing the call. Ah. Naomi, are you with us? I am, yes, apologies. Um, I was having some technical difficulties, so sorry I'm late. No worries, thank you for joining us very much. Um, uh, sorry, I was just, uh, we were just chatting, Naomi, waiting for you to come along. No um, problem. I think we've all been there with technical difficulties of various <laughs> types over the, the months on that one. Um, so Naomi, shall I hand over you to, to do the welcome? Well, really, I just wanted, um, first of all, um, to thank everyone um, for inviting me um, to come along um, and to be part of this. I think it's a really important issue. As some people know, um, I have had endometriosis. Um, I, was, I first experienced issues um, when I was um, about 15, 16 years old, um, but I wasn't diagnosed until I was 40. And so I basically left all of my adult life thinking that for most of that time that what I was experiencing was completely normal. I now know that that wasn't the case, um, but I think it speaks to the lack of awareness and education, <coughs> pardon me, that women have about their own health, that not only was I not aware that there was something fundamentally wrong that should be fixed, but also that when I went to doctors repeatedly with symptoms, some of which were quite severe, um, everything else was looked at um, before they considered that it may be a gynae issue. So they considered that it might be irritable bowel syndrome. They considered it might be stress, anxiety, all sorts of other things. None of which in the end explained away the symptoms that I was having, was having that was quite severe. It also I think says something about the degree to which people don't talk about these issues that after I spoke personally about my situation, which I sort of had to do more because my situation was about to be very public because I had to take time off work um, a few years ago to have a hysterectomy and I needed to give some reason uh, as to why I was going to be kind of absent. And my cousin found out for the first time that I had endometriosis and that she had been suffering with the same condition. And we were actually very close, but had never discussed it. I'd never had that exchange, had never asked questions or anything like that. And so I think it's, again, the taboo around education, the taboo around talking about periods and about, um, about female um, menstruation and all of those things. I think they just prevent people from being able to have the kind of open, candid conversations that they need to be able to have to get the diagnosis they need. I suppose, as I say, I was frustrated, um, as I know many of you will be, um, and felt quite let down because throughout my adult life, I had kind of carried this burden myself. Like a lot of people, I functioned during the week, but I would often find that I could barely function. I lost time off work um, because I was ill. Um, and I spent a lot of my time when I wasn't ill trying to catch up for that um, and to make up for that. I was also really conscious um, from my own point of view that the exhaustion that came with it um, and the tiredness meant that I would work all week and then just the weekends were just lost to me because I just crashed at the end of a week so exhausted um, with the pain um, that I was dealing with um, that I just couldn't, I, could, I couldn't par through. And I suppose to some degree, I felt that it was partly my fault because nothing that was suggested that was supposed to fix it seemed to work for me. And so um, I, I kind of got to a point where I just thought, well, this is just how I am. It's yeah. just how I am. 
You know what? I'm actually leaving. Because... That was kind of really difficult um, for me to deal with. I suppose a breakthrough for me had to come at some point, and it came for me when I finally collapsed in pain uh, while I was on holiday. Um, and when I was sent to the, the hospital, um, then they started investigations, which eventually led to a whole raft um, of proper um, diagnostic tests. I was checked for allergies, everything from cats um, to, to um, various household items. Um, I was checked for um, colon <clears throat> cancer. I was checked for um, gastric um, issues and all sorts of other things. And in the end, um, it was when I went and had a laparoscopy that they were able to diagnose that I had very aggressive stage four endometriosis um, that had fused part of my bowel to my womb. Um, and that was pretty invasive uh, across my pelvis. At that point, they were able to, during the, lap, the um, laparoscopic surgery, they were able to remove two um, large cysts which had grown during that time. Um, one was about the size of a grapefruit, a grapefruit and the other was about the size of an orange. And um, <clears throat> the reason that I'd been getting nausea, pain and other things was when periodically some of these very large cysts would burst um, and that would cause me really severe pain. After having that removed and thinking that that was that I was in a better place, um, I, I naively thought that that was behind me but unfortunately um, the endometriosis was very aggressive and it came back. We tried various different things and um, we tried hormonal treatments, injections, um, they stopped my ovaries working for a period in order to see if that would stop it um, and all sorts of different things that for me just didn't work because they didn't make me feel like me. I felt unwell um, and I, I just didn't, it didn't agree with me. The treatment in some ways was as bad as the cure. Eventually, um, I collapsed, I think in total about three times in pain where large cysts had, had burst um, while I was at work um, and eventually after talking through the various options, including further laparoscopic surgery uh, with my consultant. Um, I decided just based on my age at the time, um, <clears throat> so I was around 46, 47, that I would opt to have a full hysterectomy because for me, that just seemed to be the simplest course of, of treatment. Um, I was likely not to have um, early menopause given my mother and my family history. Um, she had me when she was 41. Um, my aunts had their children late in life in their, in their late 40s. And so the chances were that I could have another 10 years of that ahead of me. And for me, that wasn't a, an option. Um, and so in the end, I was able to have my surgery. But I was very fortunate because many other women in the same position um, are not now able to get that surgery. I was able to get surgery. I was on the waiting list um, for, for a, a while. Um, but the pain had become so severe that in the end um, I was able to get the surgery done. It was complex surgery as most of you will know and I suppose one of the challenges for me um, and one of the challenges that I would want to kind of focus on as part of we look at this is early diagnosis. I think that it takes far too long to get a diagnosis. Um, many of the symptoms are very similar to ovarian cancer um, and yet it takes so long that if it had been anything acute um, it would have been far too late by the time it was discovered and that still horrifies me um, given that I presented many times to the GP with the symptoms that should have alerted them. I suppose the second thing is about the car pathways that are involved about making sure that when you go to see um, a gynaecologist that it's somebody who truly understands endometriosis um, and the fact that the degree of invasion of endometriosis doesn't always reflect the degree of pain and suffering that it can cause. It just, it's very unpredictable as a disease. I suppose the, the third thing I would say that we really need to see um, is a proper pain management system, because I think for a lot of women who opt um, not to go down some of the other routes, whether that be hormonal or otherwise, to manage their pain, something has to be done to manage it. I mean, it is extreme. I mean, on three of the occasions when I was, when I was admitted to hospital, um, I required morphine because I couldn't actually cope uh, with the pain, it was so severe. And so I had been living with pain of that scale for most of my life without realizing um, that it wasn't actually normal. 
Um, and so I think having proper management of the condition so that women are able to deal with the pain and continue to live functional lives, because ultimately I think that's what we all want to do. We don't want um, we don't want this to, to completely overtake our lives. But I suppose fourthly and, and critically for me is that we need to find a way of tackling the issue and the fact that at the moment, um, if you are if you are if you are scheduled for elective surgery, your chances of actually ever getting to the operating theatre in Northern Ireland at the moment are nil. And I had a series of meetings um, in the Ulster Hospital with our management team, um, with constituents of mine who have suffered um, from endometriosis. And I mean, they were very candid. They said that at the moment, um, the service that they provide is as they described it a few years ago, a red, uh, red flag and blue light service. So if you arrive in an ambulance and you need surgery because um, there has been some torsion, for example, in your fallopian tubes or whatever it might be that is life-threatening, then you will get surgery. They will save your life. If you arrive because you have ovarian cancer, you will get surgery because they will want to save your life. But if you arrive with a chronic condition that requires laparoscopic surgery that could ease your pain and immeasurably improve your quality of life, um, if you are there on the urgent waiting list, so we're not even talking about the routine waiting list, but if you're there on the urgent waiting list uh, waiting for surgery, the chances are you will never make it to surgery because those red flags and blue light cases will use up all of the capacity um, that the surgeons have. And so unless we see a complete restructuring of services for women um, and surgical services for women, I don't think we're going to see a major transformation in how this is tackled. And for me, I find that really depressing because as somebody who's now approaching 50, um, I've lived most of my life with endometriosis um, and I'm just conscious that there are a lot of young women that I speak to now in their teens and 20s who come to me to talk about their experiences. Um, and I don't want them to have to live for another 20 or 30 years in that kind of pain um, and in that kind of distress and feeling that they can't really do all the things they want to do because they're constantly afraid of what might happen um, if their period starts, when it might stop, if it might stop, um, and whether or not they'll have the energy to participate in all the things that really matter to them. So I just think there's a there's a real challenge around health services that needs to be addressed. And I have to say, and I mean, I criticize a lot for um, for being too um, pro women in some of my uh, in some of my interventions. But I don't believe if this was a condition that affected men, that it would not be that it wouldn't be treated more seriously. I think that because of taboos around talking about menstruation and periods, um, and I think because of the presumption with women's health that being a woman comes with a degree of pain and suffering, whether that be in childbirth or whether it be with, with menstruation and periods and other things. I, I think that when women come and complain in a severe pain, it's often not taken seriously. Um, and I think that for that reason, if for no other, we really need women to step forward into this space and demand that a better service is in place. And I mean, it's something, as I say, that I've campaigned on for a number of years, not only because of my own experience, which is thankfully now in the past, um, but because I genuinely don't think um, that the treatment either I received, um, certainly in those early um, years, or indeed the treatment that many other women are receiving now is adequate um, to deal with the challenges that this places on people's lives. So um, from my perspective, I, I suppose it's really just to say that I do understand the challenges that women face. And I do fundamentally believe that we need to overhaul the system in terms of how we actually address the issues. Naomi, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I mean, it, it's um, we talk about an average of eight years for diagnosis, but my maths is so bad. But you know, we're talking twenty. That's not to say how many years too many. <laughs> yeah, decades on that one. And I think that that for me is such one of the the things around endometriosis is such a shame. So in we say that um, in the UK, the average diagnosis time in eight years is eight years. In uh, Northern Ireland, it's eight and a half years. Um, so it's higher and but that average masks quite a lot because some people do get a really good diagnosis they will be re symptoms recognized for every and they will get treatment but for everyone who gets a really good diagnosis of a year or less someone gets a 15 plus diagnosis because it's an average um, and certainly one of the things that we're calling on um, for, for all uh, NHS and all governments in every nation in, the, in England in the UK um, is to take on board that 
it's not acceptable that we haven't reduced diagnosis time in over a decade um, and to commit that by 2030 the average should be a year or less now 2030 seems a long way off but actually in terms of systems and getting things together uh, it takes time but we also know that m people have multiple visits to, to GPs with symptoms uh, Naomi, many more than average, I'm sure. But, you know, on average, people have at least 10 visits to the GP with symptoms, endometriosis isn't mentioned, five or more visits to hospitals with symptoms, endometriosis isn't mentioned. And certainly over 20% of people go to A&E three and more times with symptoms and endometriosis isn't mentioned. So it sort of feels like surely we can work out, as you say, Naomi, about how do we get a new system that streamlines things and gets people a better diagnosis and gets them the treatment they need. Um, and I think uh, we've touched on earlier that um, certainly the waiting lists are longer in Northern Ireland than anywhere else. And certainly the survey we did last March, so pre-COVID, 42% um, of people in Northern Ireland um, were waiting for more than um, uh, 10 months for surgery um, and that is is uh, that's only that's a lot higher than the rest of the UK um, and and it feels to me um, I don't know what you think about this name it feels like the, the the NHS in Northern Ireland just has never grasped the size of the issue and the reason that things are taking so long isn't because suddenly thousands and thousands of people have got extra you know diagnosed with endometriosis it's just there's very few slots given and if someone's only given two diagnostic slots um, a week for endometriosis, I don't know what the figure is currently, then only two people can be seen. As soon as you get four people you and then six, et cetera, it starts building up. Um, and so, you know, I wholeheartedly agree that in terms of um, looking at moving forward, and, and we, we will do our bit on this and hopefully working in partnership with all the MLAs here, is how do we get a better service for people in Northern Ireland and how do we get those care pathways in place? Because we've talked, um, there's something called the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Health Excellence, issued guidelines in 2017 on endometriosis. They've been adopted in Northern Ireland. They've never been implemented. And they talk about prompt diagnosis and access to specialist centres and things. Um, so I think that... Um, one of the things that we, uh, you know, we would call on is very much around implementing the NICE guidelines. And, and as you say, Naomi, completely around also pain management support and fertility support, because it's not just about, you know, waiting for some years and having surgery. What about treating the, the pain and the symptoms and helping people live with that? And one of the things we find, um, for example, uh, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and she um, has had four back surgeries and she's had four endometriosis surgeries nothing to do with each other she's just got two things but whenever she has back surgery she like has loads of prep she has physio afterwards they have like follow-up um, and yet endometriosis surgery wham you in that's out um, you know because we don't we don't do we don't like talking about wombs and vaginas we don't like thinking about physio on these but why wouldn't we do physio on that when you do it on my knee if I pull something why is my vagina less important and I think that there's that whole thing around how do we position um, women's health um, and, and I think for me and one of the other things it would be great to work with um uh, with people on the call and the MLAs is around um, trying to get menstrual well-being included in the school curriculum. So we've managed to get that agreed in England, but we haven't yet in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. And what that what's that about is exactly like you were saying, Naomi, which is around making sure that all children are talk about menstrual. Uh, menstruation so that we overcome that thing about all the boys being taken away and nobody talks about it and it's bad so that people know the right words and girls now um, uh, average age to start a period is 9 to 11 the age is going down that's another reason we're probably seeing more people with things like endometriosis earlier the age of menstruation starting is going down um, and so how is it that we make sure those people know the right words and the reason that I'm really keen it's taught in schools is it's vitally important we don't scare young kids about periods. Um, they need to be educated appropriately to know the right words and what is normal, without using the word normal, obviously, about terms of pain and experience, not just for endometriosis, but for fibroids and PMDD and PCOS and all those other things. Um, so they know when to seek help um, and so that they, they, are, they don't have you know their entire school year being a school life being told they're being a bit of a wuss they're just going to try and get out of PE to get on with it and they've got a low pain threshold which is quite often what happens so certainly around um you know that that'd be great so I think I think one of the 
I suppose if I was going to look for a silver lining, because I do think it's a, bad, a difficult position in Northern Ireland, the system wasn't working before COVID. COVID, I think we all understand, has had a massive impact. Well, but a step change now going forward. Um, so how do we make sure we get diagnosis times down? And how do we provide specialist care? Because we know that there's people sitting on this call who've got stage three, stage four endometriosis who should have had, in theory, surgery within three months of that being uh, found and that was two years ago so I suppose really is, is um, you know looking at that going forward. Uh, I don't know name if you wanted to say anything Ed or any, else or any of the MLAs wanted to mention anything at this point. The only thing I suppose I would add is that I mean as I say I have met I mean with the clinical teams and so on around this and I've written to the health trusts and tried to support my constituents some of whom have been on the waiting list I mean you ask how long the waiting list is and they say a year but you can stay on that waiting list indefinitely because Everyone else comes in ahead of you if they're an if they're an emergency case. So the urgent waiting list never really seems to get longer, but you never actually get off it. So it's that awful feeling of being constantly on a waiting list that never moves forward. Mm. And I think when I met with them and discussed with them, there were some really innovative and creative ideas coming from the surgeons. I mean, for example, for really complex surgery like I had, because my bowel and so on was involved, they needed a colorectal surgeon as well as a, a, a gynecologist um, and so on. And it was a much bigger team and that's complex. And it, it also means that women in that position are not able to just, you know, even if they can afford it, are not able to just opt out and go for private treatment. That's not anything that just can't be done because it, it's complex surgery and it requires um, aftercare. And, and the other thing, I suppose, is that um, they they have, I, I suppose, proposals as to how they could do this. But the difficulty has been that things to tackle waiting lists tend to be short term interventions. So I actually benefited from one of those waiting list interventions in that that's where I they finally got to grips with what was wrong with me and that they sent me for a lot of tests when I went to see somebody through a waiting list um, management program. But at the same time, the money then dries up uh, and the backlog continues because structurally the service hasn't changed. I think what we actually need is a longer amount of money that's given to the hospitals over a period of five years where they can tackle the waiting list but also restructure the service as they go because I think that there are places where less complex surgery for example could be done there would be theatre time made available um, but it would require them to develop new surgical teams to be able to deliver that um, and that would give us a permanent solution to some of the difficulties that we face. Um, but the problem is, as I say, that most of the interventions around waiting lists tend to be quite short term. Um, the focus is on getting as many people um, dealt with in the period while the money is available, rather than trying to restructure um, provisions so that it is more sustainable going forward. And I suppose from my perspective, I would like to see that um, taken forward in, in a more constructive way. I think COVID offers an opportunity because we'll be building back services piece by piece after COVID because many of the services have been disrupted. And so there's an opportunity to do things differently, to look at regional provision as opposed to um, people going to the nearest hospital um, and, and services being duplicated. And I mean, I would frankly have traveled anywhere just to get my surgery and, and get, get this done. And I think most women would feel the same way. But there is a genuine issue then about how you invest in the resources that are required to ensure um, that people can uh, get their surgery um, in, a, in an appropriate time. Because the waiting does affect people's mental health and it starts to make you doubt yourself. And I was told so many times that there was nothing wrong with me and I began to feel like, well, I'm a hypochondriac because I definitely feel there is. My husband knew there was, um, but nobody else could tell me what it was. And I started to doubt myself in terms of why I, I felt the way I did. And was I just, was I just being overdramatic? Was I just, um, you know, a bit more um, sensitive to pain than other people? And it wasn't really until the point where I went to the consultant and I had my, my laparoscopic surgery and I, I came out of surgery and I woke up and the consultant said to me, wow, that was the worst case I have dealt with yet. And actually, bizarrely, I was reassured um, because it suddenly confirmed for me that it wasn't in my head, that it was a physical problem that I had and that I hadn't imagined it. And just living with that stress over a long period of time does take does have an impact on people's well-being. As I say, I was fortunate I had supportive family and they understood the situation and that made it a lot easier. But I, I genuinely think for a lot of people, it's incredibly difficult. 
I think we also need to have much more candid conversations around um, these issues with school. I mean, I was one of those kids who was forever in sick bay. Um, you know, every time it got to that time of the month, I was I was in sick bay. But for me, that time of the month could last anything from 10 days to two weeks, sometimes even longer. Um, and then in between, I had pain as well. Um, so, you know, it was people sort of thought I was dragging it out and making more of it than it was. But it was just it wasn't for me like most people. And, and I don't think that was recognized. Um, and I think you're right that a lot of a lot of kids feel under pressure when they're at school um, because it's seen as a way of trying to escape things or not want to be involved with PE or not want to be engaged in the things that are going on in school when actually um, they're struggling with something that's really very personal, um, but also um, they don't know how to really talk to anyone about it because they feel it's quite taboo. I was also, my my mum was a lot older um, when she had me. And for that reason, she came from a generation where you just didn't discuss these things at all. Um, and so it wasn't even like we could have a conversation about it. We were incredibly close, but it wasn't something I felt I could talk to her about because her generation didn't talk about these things. So I think we do need to change. Things are changing for the better, but I think we need to change the conversation um, and give women, I, I think, a little bit more confidence to actually push back and say, I'm not satisfied with being told that it's something I want, I want to be checked, I want to be sure. Um, and I would always say to women now, if you're suffering that kind of pain on a regular basis, um, don't let anyone tell you it isn't real. Insist that you're checked. Ask. They can do blood tests, which gives some indication of whether there are issues with endometriosis, for example. It can rule out things like ovarian cancer. And for your own peace of mind, insist that you get those tests, because I just think it would have made a world of difference to me when I was worried about those things, um, when I was, you know, at the beginning, particularly, um, to have somebody be able to say to me, no, we know what it is. And I could have coped with it a lot better, I think, had I known. Yeah, thank you. And Colm, you've been patiently having your hand up. Is there something you wanted to, to add? Yeah, thank, thanks, Emma. And, and thank you, Naomi, for, you know, I, I did, as Paula mentioned, I did attend that endometriosis event in the Long Gallery or in 115, back just before everything. And I was deeply, I have to say, a struck by the, the impact it was having on people, by the lack of services, by the difficulty getting a diagnosis and all of that. So um, I do recognise that. I also think there's some truth in what Naomi says there around, you know, if this was seen to be a men's issue. And I think COVID has kind of starkly underlined some of those uh, impacts that, that land on women generally more, you know, in terms of in terms of health, in terms even of care, and in terms of working in frontline health and social care jobs, all of these things. And I am aware that, that even before COVID, there was actually a slight slide starting in terms of life expectancy. And I think women were being uh, disproportionately impacted by that. Naomi's right that this is, this is a huge issue in terms of, but I think there is also some potential in that we're being told that a lot of the silos that exist within health have had to be dismantled as a result of COVID. And when we build back, I would firmly believe that we should be looking at building back better. I've spoken, and I know Paula has, has with myself met uh, with the Royal College of Surgeons, and they are telling us that they now see things through a different lens. They're, they're quite prepared to look at a regional model. They talk about this hub and spoke model, and surgeons now are prepared to travel more. And they're, they're proposing that we look at a situation where there's COVID protected sites, but at the end of the day, I think it's going to take for endometriosis and, as Paula mentioned, things like the fertility services, the same focus and drive that was put on a sustained focus and drive that was put in COVID will have to be brought on to, brought, brought to the waiting list. And that obviously brings us into the realms of workforce, which is hindering every aspect of health and social care across the north. Um, and these all require longer term planning, longer term budgeting and longer term focus. So I'm, I, I, I will do all I can and work with Paul and work with everyone on the, on the committee. I think the health committee, and I will actually mention the fact that we've had this meeting tonight and that, that the issue has been raised again. Obviously, that's, there's been a year lost now with COVID, but endometriosis was starting off from a very, very poor floor in any case. So I think that that, that, just, uh, that just highlights the urgency around this. So. Um, I'll have to drop off shortly. I have a long-term commitment to attend another meeting with the pharmacy with the pharmacy representatives. So I'll have to drop off soon. But 
I really appreciate being invited along tonight, and I, I am aware of the issues. I don't have the solutions, but I'm prepared to do all I can to help to those who may have the solutions to, to facilitate them. Thank you, Colm, and um, much appreciated. And obviously, do, do drop off when you need to. Um, I think that... Um, I think for me it is is it's absolutely right that if we look you use the phrase build back better and I think there is a lot of better we can do going forward I suppose and I I don't know the answer to this at all is that I can see us building back better and I can see in three to five years time things being better hopefully we'll also have um, been working with you to get mental well-being included in the school curriculum so people start to be aware but but how do we support people over the next immediate you know one, two, three years for people who are, are, are waiting now. And I don't know if there's any plans in, in yet. It might be too early about how risk services are going to resume in Northern Ireland. I don't know if any of the MLAs have any information on that. Paula, you're uh, waiting. Thank you, Emma. Um, just to follow on from Colin, I'll not, I'll not repeat what he has said there about what we can do through the health committee. Um, but two, two things of, of note, yesterday the, the health minister might even have been today, mentioned that the, he's going to be releasing his report at the end of this month about the build back for April, May, June. So that, that is imminent, that's been worked on. I think that'll be quite small scale as we still reopen society, but I think going forward, there's an opportunity to influence that. But I suppose that probably the best mechanism with the best vehicle to take forward these issues in the assembly may actually be the all party group on women's health. And that's chaired by Orlea Flynn, um, Colum's um, colleague. But that has a good representation on that. And obviously, if we're just really focusing in on women, and there are also a lot of um, observers and, and women's sectoral groups on that who obviously will understand this and be able to knit it across other, other parts of women's health, I think that might be a good next step, even just to come along and do a more um, targeted presentation of the issues. And then through that, then we could we could be taking the issues forward. But as I say, we, we can do things through assembly questions or raising it through the health committee, but I think the APG on women's health is probably the best mechanism to give it the focus um, across a number of meetings that, that this would require. You're on mute, Emma. Has Emma dropped off there? Is, is this what the issue is? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure as to whether it was just my end that my <laughs> computer had frozen and everyone else was carrying on, but. I think we all thought that, Claire. I've just had a message from Emma saying she's um, she's just trying to um, rejoin, so hopefully she can um, join shortly. I don't know if anyone else um, in the audience has got any questions, perhaps, Claire, I don't know if you've got any questions um, that you'd perhaps like to ask of any of the yeah, MAs yeah. that are here. Um, it, yes, um, so I was at the hospital yesterday and, you know, I have just continuously been told that there's nothing they can do and that I just have to wait. Um, I just have to wait. But what, I, what I'm being told is that if I want something to be done to reach out to my MLAs, um, but what can I do to proactively, like, I think, you know, what can I do on my end to really try and push this forward? Because, um, you know, I've been waiting over two years with suspected stage four endometriosis with very large cysts. Um, and that's just, that's from two years ago. I'm just wondering 
you know, it, it gets very frustrating when you're going to the doc, the, the hospital continuously and being told we can't do anything. And it, it's just disgraceful. So like, what can I do from my end to really push this, I suppose, is what I'm asking. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people here um, are thinking along the same sort of lines. Um, Claire, what trust area do you live in? Um, I was, first of all, I was um, Lagan Valley and then it was over to the Ulster. Um, but you see, my concern was, you know, I've been to A&E multiple times um, in, I mean, agony, like, and um, because cysts basically had, I've been told that the cysts had got so large that they had um, leaked or ruptured. And then that was kind of causing like an infection, which I was really sick with. So I was in agony and constantly thrown up. Um, but I was then basically told at A&E and to quote that was, well, you don't have cancer. And what are you worried about? It's not going to affect your chances of having kids. And I think the issue here is that within A&E, I know, I understand that um, endometriosis is a, like, you know, um, gynecologists will be the ones that look at that. And more specifically, but when you're told when you're in complete agonizing pain that it's just as well you don't have cancer and um, that, oh, this won't affect your fertility, which is complete nonsense because endometriosis is a massive effect on fertility. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's just more like, what can I do? Because I just feel so um, helpless, I guess. Um, okay. Thank you, Claire, for sharing your, your story with us. I suppose I was asking because in the Belfast Trust, there's a public liaison that the MLAs I represent South Belfast. So we would write to the Belfast Public Liaison Trust and, and then raise a query on behalf of a constituent. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a similar one in, in your trust, but you know I'll be happy to take, take that on. What they are doing at the minute because of COVID and because a lot of the surgery and other treatments have been delayed, and I think um, Colin touched upon it there, is that they're doing what you would call a regionali regionalization so that it's not, so it's not just the worst in your trust area. There will be like a, just a hierarchy or a, a list in, in terms of, 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 of need across the whole of Northern Ireland and you'll be brought forward based on that. Um, I find that whenever you do um, put forward and get your MLA, then it's almost like a creaking gate. I think it's more that they just try to do it to stop the public representatives um, contacting and stuff. So if you want to email me after, or if you're any other your, um, MLAs in the area you live in, you know, this is this is things we do every day of the week for constituents. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Hi there. I just a really good point that um, Claire had raised is something that I've experienced too. I think it would be really great to be able to get a bit more of the education into the A&E side of things because I feel like there's a real lack of understanding um, in A&E because obviously you know they're not specialized in anything to do with that and if it's a chronic illness it, I just think it would be really great if there was a way we could get some more knowledge about what endometriosis is and how it affects us into A&E so that we can maybe get something from that whenever we feel that we need to go there. They're actually, they're, they're actually doing a review of emergency and urgent care at the minute and, and that even then brings in the out of hours. So I suppose while they're actually doing, having a look at how the service is delivered as a whole, then you know there, there's maybe an opportunity then to feed in around where there's gaps as we but like people are presenting with acute mental health um, problems. It's probably yeah. the last place people should be going, but it's the only, yeah. the only option for them. And it's probably very similar here that you much prefer to be going to a gynae clinic or some other- Exactly. Um, um, situations far more in keeping with your circumstances at that, that time so again I can I can raise that so they're looking at the sort of I think it's no more silos they call it um strategy looking at um urgent care at the minute that's brilliant thank you and um, could I add a, a question into this as well so endometriosis UK is is a really good resource and it recommends that when we're seeking treatment um as as individuals, be that that we're trying to obtain it through the NHS or for those who are lucky enough that they have uh, the funds or uh, the provision for private healthcare, that we should try to go to a BSGE accredited centre. There is not a BSGE accredited centre in the north of Ireland. There's so many women who are having to travel outside of the north pay privately, try and go to another NHS trust, 
in England because that's the only place where the BSGE centres are. Are there any plans or can the MLAs discuss this at assembly about re-establishing a BSGE centre in the north and not just in Belfast because there's women across the whole of the north who need this support and to have to expect them to continue to travel outside of the country for essential health care is just not acceptable anymore. Um, we, we really need this support here, whatever about individuals, personal circumstances, when we're advised by the charities that this is the gold standard of what we should be seeking, it should be provided to us. Mm. Can I, can I just echo that? I'm a lot older by the sounds of things than Alicia and Claire. Um, my experience way back in 2008, um, it, it doesn't sound very dissimilar to the experiences of the ladies speaking on the call tonight. Um, no specialist. Um, I had a general surgeon operate in my stage four endometriosis to remove an ovary and tube and um, my bowel was perforated which went undetected and I ended up in ICU and there were further surgeries with colostomies and so on um, and I really felt I had no choice then and with regard moving forward I was given a choice either a full hysterectomy or partial um, and not the hormone treatment that I had been on and quite successfully so at that time, I certainly felt my choices were limited, that there were no specialists available. And also much like Claire's comment on a and &E, I was told about my pain and other symptoms that I was being precious on a number of occasions. And I can tell you after 30 plus years of endometriosis and still ongoing and um, recent biopsies after a, a cancer scare, um, it's not being precious, it's something that takes over your life and it, it, it really is quite disappointing that these young ladies are experiencing what sounds like what I had hoped had maybe moved on. So I think that that education piece with the broader health service and the mental health side of things of having multiple years of being told that you're making it up or that you're a little bit weak or you're not good with pain whenever actually the complete opposite is true and um, that you're actually if you're functioning you're really great with pain and you can manage your life really well and you but it shouldn't have to be that hard. I suppose, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Paula, I, I, I soon have to drop off for a wonder. I wonder, can I just, I was, I was just thinking, uh, developing on from the point that you said about the review of emergency cure, actually it'd be very useful if, if the endometriosis organisations there themselves would contribute to that as, as of right, highlighting the issues that, that you have in that sense. And the other thing that struck me as the conversation was going along there, one of the things that the, surgeon, the, the Royal College of Surgeons had said was, that they are looking very actively at how better and more sustainable services can be delivered on the island of Ireland where you use the greater population to develop and roll out services to prevent that need to travel sometimes well to fly you may you might have to travel but the, the additional burden of flying and a family on flying so that might be something that i'm not sure if there is any connections with with other groups on the island but it may be the case that specialisms can be developed uh, around around bigger population centers so that's just another another suggestion thank you thank you Senator. thank you so much for raising that sorry my name's Faye I'm the campaigns and communications manager at Endometriosis UK I'm just standing in for Emma slightly whilst, um, whilst she can't get back online. Um, but I think tonight's shown that there is such a long way to go in improving endometriosis care in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, we've heard from people who've had their diagnosis years ago and, and hearing that things actually haven't really changed since, which shows, you know, how far there really is to go and how much work we can all do together um, between patients and between all the MLAs um, who are really passionate about this cause. Well, so even though there is a long way to go, I think there is positives in what we can do. And thank you so much for highlighting those um, consultations that are out. We'll definitely make sure to respond to those and hear from everybody on the call um, about your experiences into that as well. 
Um, so we will do um, a follow-up email with everyone that's joined this evening. Um, Colm and Paula, I'll be in touch with both of you as well to see how we can um, move this forward. And it's great to hear that the Women's Health Party Group has now been set up. Paula, I know last time we met, you said that was um, about, to, about to be launched. So it's great that that's now um, in place. So we'd love to be involved in that and perhaps look to see what investigations we can do into care in Northern Ireland as part of that group. So thank you so much, everyone. I don't know if anyone else has got any more um, questions. Uh, we've got until until seven. So if anyone does have any further questions, please do. Um, please do so. Hilary, you've got your hand up. Do you want to add something? Oh, you're on mute, Hilary, sorry. Sorry, um, thanks very much, Faye, um, and thanks to uh, Naomi and to Paula and to Colum for their interest, and especially to Naomi for her courage in, in speaking about her experience tonight. Um, I am not an endometriosis sufferer, but I am someone who uh, for years uh, doctors told me I was suffering from it. I was actually not suffering from it. I was suffering from an entirely different condition. But I now have a future daughter-in-law who is a sufferer, who has just had surgery and um, is, well, is, is recovering, can't walk uh, at the minute because of the pain. And uh, I've listened carefully to, to what has been said tonight. And I think certainly there needs to be an issue addressed in terms of GP training, in terms of the a &E training, and also in terms of these national guidelines that are applicable in England that haven't been implemented here, that do need to keep pace. And uh, a recognition that endometriosis is not is part of the problem, but it's a wider issue that encompasses fertility issues. It encompasses menopause issues and HRT. It's all these things that are thrown in together, and that what really is needed is a top-down remedy where resources are directed to the problem, and the Department of Health addresses it seriously. And um, you know, I, I think that if the, um, if the politicians and the health professionals were to look, stand back and look at it, uh, they would realise that there would be long-term savings in actually setting up um, uh, clinics and uh, specialised treatment to address it, rather than women being directed for years along incorrect treatment pathways, you know? So this, the long-term savings are, are there to be had if the proper course is followed. And I think that's something that, that needs to be emphasised too. And Paula, you obviously have an interest, but I think, you know, people who are suffering all these problems now want solutions now. And as Claire rightly said, they want to know what they can do. Can you um, have a petition, for example? You know, how can they be proactive in getting this issue into the spotlight? And I think that that's a really vital issue. And um, Paula, might, you might want to take that up. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. I suppose my first um, port of call will be to put a series of questions into the health minister, not least about the NICE guidance, but also that BSGA accredited centre. You know, there's I've learned a lot tonight, actually, I have to say, um, just to follow up on a, on a number of that so that we can get a bit of a baseline um, so that then we know then where, where, where we can move forward. But as I say, I raised the issue of the lack of a consultant. Um, surgeon with um, the mm -hmm. health minister a few weeks ago and he wasn't aware, but you know, we have to give him a bit of credit. He's in the middle of a COVID pandemic and he, you know, there's a lot of other things going on, but we, we just have to find a way to get this this actually on the agenda. So we'll give it some thought, Hilary and the rest of you um, going forward about how we work through the health committee to, to raise this and feed in. And as um, I think it was Faye was saying there, it'll follow up tomorrow. So I'm happy to provide any of the links to any of the um, information I've passed um, tonight. But if anybody wants to comment to me about their own personal circumstances, like Claire there, um, I'm, I'm happy to chase up with the relevant trust. All right, could I just say something um, too? Um, I can't echo enough, Hilary, how much I, I agree with you. I am not an endometriosis sufferer either. And sorry, I can't get uh, my video on, so apologies if there's no camera. 
Um, I work for Fertility Network and we are a charity that look after um, support people who have fertility issues. Um, and obviously we um, deal with a lot of people who suffer from endometriosis. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, a disease area that's very important to us. Um, and we have been trying, we've piloted um, an education program which is targeted at 16 to 25 year olds. Um, looking at things that can affect your fertility or all range of things, but that obviously would also include endometriosis um, and other diseases like polycystic ovarian syndrome. But we have we piloted, we had fantastic response from healthcare professionals. It was seen um, as a fantastic project, um, really a, a public health um, project, um, educating young people and something that they don't really think about. And that they have, it's not really talked about. Um, and it is mirrored on a very successful program that is currently running in Scotland, um, is funded by the Scottish government. Um, but we can't get it past the pilot. And um, we've searched for funding to try and introduce this like it is in Scotland, um, because we can see the benefits of this um, in terms of um, providing education, um, starting discussions with young people about things, including their periods and what isn't, what isn't normal, um, and so that they can go and seek help um, early on and hopefully avoid um, having the long waits. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to, to your attention, uh, Paula, and thank you so much, everyone this evening who has contributed uh, their stories. You know, they're really, really very, very powerful. Um, and I hope something positive can be come from this this evening. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much for everyone's questions and for sharing all your experiences. Um, and particular thanks to all the MLAs that have joined and Paula uh, for stepping in at the end <laughs> and sharing the meeting. So thank you, everyone, so much. Um, if anyone does want to get in contact with me, um, I've put my email address in the chat. Um, it's just communications at endometriosis-uk.org um, and we'd love to hear from you um, and hear how we can support you in our awareness raising um, going forward. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>